Well, Father, thank you for your word that, that you have given to us. And Father, we, we want to handle your word properly. We want to handle it carefully so that it does the work that you intend for it to do in our lives. And so we submit ourselves to you and thank you for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts and minds and, and bring your word back to us just when we need it in Jesus' name. The title I have this morning is Getting Serious. Now, there's two ways I'm referring to getting serious. First of all, things are getting serious. And Steve talked about that Friday night. To start with, let's go to Luke chapter 17. I will say... That the the news media, I believe, deliberately distracts people with the news cycle, and that there are sometimes important things that are not being told to the general public, <clears throat> and then other things which may be of some importance, but maybe not quite as important, that, that get just blasted so that everybody's attention is on that. And then a few days later, it switches to something else. And so by doing that, people just get information overload and they decide that, well, you know, this is the same old stuff all the time. I'm just going to occupy my life with what I occupy my life with, whatever that might be. And what the devil is doing with that is he's, he's pushing forward his agenda. Now, what God wants to do with that is push forward his agenda, too. And so that's the other part of what I mean by getting serious is that, yes, these are serious times, even though we don't know half of it, really, what's going on out there. But we should get serious because God has some serious business for us to tend to here in the days that lie ahead. Anyway, Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the time of the Son of Man. People ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage right up to the day when Noah went into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. So also it was in the days of Lot. People ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heavens and destroyed them all. They were just going about business as usual. And that's what the devil wants so he can... Uh, wipe out humanity so that he can catch us all by surprise. And we are not supposed to do that. And that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I get, wait a minute, I should have told you, keep the place in Luke. We will be back there in a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I believe this was actually the title of Steve's message Friday. Uh, wasn't it, Steve? What did we decide to call that? Uh, keep, your sense of urgency. keep your sense of urgency. Yes. Okay, well, that's, that's what this says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I think the King James Version says it, be instant in season and out of season. You know, I've heard that phrase used a lot in religious circles, and I never really knew what that meant until I read, oh, that's what, that's what the King James says this verse here, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, <clears throat> which is, in the Amplified, herald and preach the word, keep your sense of urgency. Now that really is what getting serious with God means, is we got to keep a sense of urgency. You know, if there's not a, 
a, a formula to getting serious with God. It's not, well, getting serious means I've got to read the Bible so much and I've got to pray so much and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. No. It just means you keep an awareness of, okay, it's like in the world they, they have the thing they call situation awareness. You know, if you're going into a, a strange city or something, they say you've got to be aware of your surroundings. Like put your wallet in your front pocket and don't leave it in your back pocket. And if you're carrying a purse, hook it around your neck. Don't leave it just hanging on your shoulder because you don't know what's out there. And somebody can easily uh, come and rob you. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're not going to be, you know, looking at your device or you're not going to be, oh, isn't this a, you know... All these pretty tall buildings and stuff, you know. That, that's not situational awareness. Situational awareness is, hey, I recognize there's some, some unseen danger here and I need to be prepared so that I don't uh, just dumbly fall into it. Okay, well, that's kind of your sense of urgency. There's a spiritual aspect to that. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by, be at hand and ready whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, you, as a preacher of the Word, you say, well, I'm not a preacher of the Word. Well, let's talk about that a minute. Preaching the Word isn't just standing up here. Preaching the Word, in fact, isn't just, you know, what you say to others that's biblically based. I mean, it, that is preaching, okay, but you're preaching with the way you live. You're preaching with your attitude. You're preaching with your values, with your morals, with your choices. You know, that's really when it says a person, you know, by their fruit you will know them. That word fruit actually means choices. You know, you have, you have an option here. You can go this way, you can go that way. Well, which way you go tells what's in your heart. See, that's choices. All right. That's how you preach. You have to show people in what way their lives are wrong. That doesn't mean you grab them by the car and say, you're wrong, you need to do this. No, it means you're going to show them what's wrong by you doing what's right, and God's going to bless you for doing what's right. Or you choose what's wrong, and you're going to, you're going to be you know, suffering bad consequences, and they say, well, I don't want to go where they went. <laughs> right? Okay. And convince them, rebuking, correcting, warning, urging, and encouraging, being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and in teaching. Okay, another thing Steve talked about Friday night, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, he talked about it a little bit this morning. I just wanted to say, this is something that I've noticed that there's I've been hearing lots of airplanes flying. A lot of airplanes flying. There are. You know, this is interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things they're not telling you on the news is war. I mean big war. I, I, I don't know if I'll say, I don't know if I'll call it World War III or not, but war on a global scale is underway. We're not waiting for that, you know. We're not waiting for a Pearl Harbor to tell us World War III is. It, it's, it's already in process. Now, that, that's actually an interesting segue into what the Scripture says because, because there, there's war going on. That, that there were U.S. troops that were bombed by Iran in Syria a couple of days ago. American troops died being bombed by Iranians. Okay, and that's not even to talk about what's going on in Ukraine and how NATO and the Russian are, 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 you know, shooting at each other. And that's not even to talk about what the Chinese do over in the China Sea. I mean, well, they're getting ready for the World War III thing, but it's really kind of underway already. You know, back in World War II, speaking of which, before Pearl Harbor, they actually... Uh, England actually declared war on Germany on September the 1st, 1939. That was more than two years before Pearl Harbor. But for the first year, there wasn't just a whole lot that happened other than the Nazis moved into Poland and started rounding up all the Jews and putting them in ghettos. But in America, they didn't, they kind of, oh, oh it's, it's a phony war over there. Yeah, well, we'll you know, and meanwhile, uh, Britain is buying all the, all the war equipment that they can buy, and America's, 
you know, uh, military industrial complex was glad to build all the stuff that England, it's like, hey, I, you know, hey, this is great. I got a, got a steady job here. So anyway, well, that's kind of where we're at today. But anyway, here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong place. Well, let's, let's finish that. Will be attended by great power with pretended miracles and signs and delusive Marvels, lying wonders. Well, now, here's the point. Here's how I'm relating this to us getting serious. That's the warfare we find ourselves in. You know, Jesus, when they ask him, well, what's going to be the sign of your second coming? He said, be careful no one deceive you. Right? So, so deception is our warfare. Our warfare is not guns and lasers and drones. I mean, that's, there's other parts of the world that are using all that stuff. Our warfare is against error, against doctrines, and against uh, deception. Now go to verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness, which is a, a principle of rebellion against constituted authority, is already at work in the world, but it is restrained only until he who restrains is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. Now that's what Steve was talking about this morning when he said that the devil is not going to be able to keep the, the coming forth of the manifested sons. He's not, he's not going to destroy the man-child in the womb because he wants to see what the man manifested son, what the man-child looks like so he can copy it. But then it goes on to say, and the Lord Jesus will, bring, will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by his appearing. Well, what we should take from that, and my, my point today is, we are not going to stop what the devil and the Antichrist are doing in this world. It says the Lord Jesus is going to do it. And you can say, well, okay, but, he, but the Lord Jesus is in me, so, you know, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But it says, when is he going to do it? At his coming. That means until he comes back, the devil is going to be going right along with his agenda, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse in this world, folks. That's, that, that's the truth. You know, we better, we better accept that. We better, we better order our lives according to that understanding rather than a lot of, you know, the message of, of victory, of victory of the cross, victory in Jesus and, and triumphant grace and, and all of these things that are, that are to, to pump up the church to think that, oh, we're going we're gonna to take back the seven mountains of culture. That's not, what, that's not what Scripture says is going to happen. Okay, verse 8. But then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by his appearing and his coming. Well, okay. You know, I, I do understand why Christians would, would think that what I just said maybe doesn't sound really all that spiritual. is because maybe they don't really understand, and I'm not sure any of us do, what that means in 1 John chapter 5 where it says the whole world is under the power of the evil one. Well, how can that be? Then, then you're saying one of two things that, that don't make sense. It's like then you're saying, well, well, God is not sovereign or else if you're saying God is sovereign but he still uh, delegated the devil to run the show, it's like, well, then, then the devil is really a servant of God. I'm not saying either one of those things. Now, in another sermon, probably Tuesday or Wednesday night, uh, if, if the, the, the creek don't rise, uh, I will talk about judgment. See, there's three things that make, make for judgment. First of all, in James chapter 1, it says that, that don't say when you're being tempted or tested or tried that God's doing it. It doesn't even say don't say the devil's doing it. It says that, that only happens because there's a place of vulnerability in you that you have not dealt with. 
it refers to that as your own lust or your own desire, your own evil desires. You know, we'll call it sin, okay? God judges sin, and to the extent there's sin in us, it's going to get judged. Okay, that's fact number one. Fact number two, the devil looks for those things to get in there to do his dirty work. Now, the third thing, which the devil doesn't understand, we'll talk about this more on, t on Wednesday, I guess, is that God takes advantage of all the stuff the devil does to do a work that's greater than what the devil has in mind. The devil is doing, I think there's a line in the song, How Firm a Foundation, it says, uh, when through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I've only designed thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. So when we have been vulnerable to Satan because of stuff in us that's not right, and the devil starts attacking us, God says, okay, there's some stuff you need to let go of, Ray. Just let go of it, and it's going to be better. And sometimes it's painful, but you let go, and it's better. And see, that's what Romans 8, 28 says. All things work together for good. God can even take the stuff that the devil intends to destroy us, and, and he will refine us with that. But he didn't do it. And we can't really blame the devil on it. We brought it on ourselves. Okay, I just preached Wednesday sermon. <laughs> All right. But another thing about this that maybe we should understand about that business uh, is go to Habakkuk chapter 1. Is that the devil uses those times when sin comes up for judgment to bring destruction on God's people. So we shouldn't just welcome, you know, the trial. This is another religious idea. Some people say, oh, well, you know, if they got cancer, it says, well, okay, God gave me this to, to purify me or to teach me a lesson or to take me home early because something bad's coming and he doesn't want me here for that. No, 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 no. <clears throat> the devil's the one that does it. And his intention is to rid the planet of people, first of all, but his first step to do that is to rid the planet of Christianity. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand against who? Against Donald Trump? No. Against the Republicans? No. Against the Lord? Who's the Lord? Jesus. And against his anointed? Who is his anointed? Hello, his anointed. That says the kings of the earth are against us. Oh no, they're not. We have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Not anymore we don't, folks. Get serious. It hadn't been that way for hundreds of years. Okay, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 7. The Chaldeans... Now, I could explain this as being whoever the dominant world power is. So when I spoke of the kings of the earth take their stand, okay, at, at that time in 700 B.C., whenever it was that this was written, the Chaldeans were the dominant power in the world. Well, now we have a situation in this world where America and Russia and China and, and Western Europe are all jockeying for who's going to be the Chaldeans in this world. It might be all of them. In fact, truthfully, I think that there's other powers that are kind of manipulating all of those nations. Is the, the money powers that are selling the armaments to all of those nations. They just want to see, you know, it's like you and he fight, and then whoever wins, I, I'm, I'm going to go with them. <laughs> That's kind of the way that it works. Okay. The Chaldeans are terrible and dreadful. Their justice and dignity proceeds only from themselves. That is the way that it works in this world. Might makes right. And the one with the most money gets the court judgments. Okay. 
Their horses are swifter than leopards and fiercer than evening wolves. That means they're predators. <clears throat> their horsemen, this is an interesting correlation with Revelation 6, I would say. Their horsemen spread themselves and press on proudly. Yes, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle that hastens to devour. They all come for violence. Their faces turn eagerly forward and they gather prisoners together like sand. They scoff at kings and rulers. See, I'm telling you, there's a power that's above Vladimir Putin and above Joe Biden and above Xi Jinping or whatever his name is. Okay. And they, uh, they laugh at those people. They ridicule every stronghold, for they heap up dust and take it. Then they sweep by like a wind and pass on, and they load themselves with guilt, as do all men whose own power is their God. This has happened over and over through human history. Go to Luke chapter 19. Verse 41. Next Sunday is what the traditional religious calendar calls Palm Sunday, which is the week, the Sunday before Easter, which is the resurrection, the days that is celebrated. And that is, according to the scripture, the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last week before his crucifixion. And the people were so excited that this celebrity had come to town that they came out and they, they put palm branches down for him to, to ride over on his donkey. Right? It was a ticker tape parade, I guess we would say today. And you would think that this was a, a, a glorious occasion, but look what Jesus did in verse 41. It says, as he approached and saw the city, he wept audibly over it, exclaiming, Would that you had known personally, even at least in this your day, the things that make for peace. And peace here, the Amplified defines as freedom from distresses that are experienced as the result of sin. See, peace would be described a situation where there's not judgment. You know, there's war and peace, right? Well, we could say there's judgment and then there's peace. He said, would, you, would that you'd known what you could do so that you wouldn't come under judgment. There's another, uh, that's my paraphrase. But now those things are hidden from your eyes. For a time is coming upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank about you and surround you and shut you in on every side. They will dash you down to the ground, you and your children with you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, all because you did not progressively come to recognize and know from observation and from experience the time of your visitation. We have a time of visitation coming upon us in our future. Are we going to recognize it? Because if we don't, it says the enemies are going to come upon us. And I think if, if you look at Daniel chapter 7, the way uh, Steve has been teaching it to us for a bunch of years, uh, that eagle whose wings get clipped is probably America. And so uh, being dashed about on every side and, and all the people here being nuked, is, is more of a possibility now than it had ever been, even since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, the, the, we're, we're right on the brink of, of this, what he describes happening there to Jerusalem, then to happen here in our day. We should get serious about this. We should not say, oh, well, they've been saying that for hundreds of years. Nobody knows, so just let's have another, another cup of coffee or another glass of wine or, you know, whatever. Okay, Ze uh, Zechariah chapter 1. Keep the place in Luke. Zechariah 
Man, you don't know what you were saying there. And the other day, there, there's a uh, there's a YouTube channel that I check frequently, and I think Steve and Tammy check this too, where they show this guy is an ex-military guy, lives in San Antonio. And he shows all of the, he's got some kind of software that can show all the aircraft that are in the air at any moment in time. And it all identifies each plane by its call number. So he can identify, is this a commercial jet or is this a military jet? And what kind of jet it is? Is it a, a C-130 carrying cargo or is it is a 747 carrying people? And as of the latter part of last week, there was massive movements of troops from all of military uh, assets and, and people from all over the country, all over the world, from America, from China, from Russia, from Western Europe, they're all up in the air. So, so what you were picking up in the spirit has been verified by this guy in, in San Antonio. I mean, that's a fact. You, you were just getting it. Okay, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7. Upon the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shebat, in the second year of the reign of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet. And Zechariah said, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. Well, we know from Revelation chapter 6, that the red horse is war. Okay. The man was riding on the red horse and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the low valley behind him. And there were other horses. There were horses red, flame-colored, and white. And then I said, Oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel who talked with me said, Well, I'll show you what these are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth and patrol it. And the men on the horses answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees. We have walked to and fro upon the earth, and behold, all the earth sits at rest. These war horses are riding, and, they're, and while they're doing it, they've got their surveillance cameras all pointing every which way, and they say, oh yeah, the population's all subdued. You know, they're, they're all put to sleep, they're all zombified, they're all medicated, they're all distracted. And so, what does the Lord say? Verse 11, no, excuse me, verse 12. The angel of the Lord said, How long... Lord, will you not have mercy and loving kindness on Jerusalem and on Judea against whom you've had indignation these 70 years? Well, what he's talking about there is that the, the dumbing down of the people is what's allowing this, this war horse to ride. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I know this is preached a lot. And I also know there's, there's something in human nature. You know, they say don't beat a dead horse, okay? Well, I'm not sure this is a dead horse, but sometimes when we hear something over and over, after a while, you just kind of tune it out. You say, yeah, I've heard that before. Or, or maybe you even kind of want to argue with it a little bit and say, well, yeah, but, but look at this over here. How can you say that when this over here is this way? And so, maybe we deal with, a, Steve talked about this Friday night. He talked about call it cognitive dissonance is the, the big highfalutin term for what that is. It's when you see, okay, yeah, this is true here, but this over here is also true, and they don't mesh. Okay, so 
this is one of those things, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this so we will not let cognitive dissonance make us sleepy. See, getting serious means we got to stay awake. We got to have situational awareness of what's going on in our world. So we are ready, and we're not going to be like the people in the days of Noah or the people in the days of Sodom, that we're just going to go about our business and then boom, all of a sudden we get nuked and we're dead. That's not God's highest and best attention, intention for us, right? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. As to the suitable times and precise seasons. You know, we talked about how the, the, the bringing forth of the man-child is a precise season with the coming forth, the revealing of the Antichrist. Point being there, they're both works in progress. You are a work in progress and the bringing forth of the Antichrist is a work in progress. In fact, I would even be so bold as to say what God is doing in us is what's keeping the devil from succeeding in what he is wanting to do. Now, there will be 144,000 who get that work done within themselves. We can be those. We can, we can, oh, it's like, if not us, who? You know, who are you going to toss that ball to? Say, I, I don't think I can make it. So here, you do it. Who's the you you're going to toss that ball to? You be it. Okay, suitable times and precise seasons and dates, brethren. You have no necessity for anything being written to you, for you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and suddenly as a thief in the night. You know, Jesus said this himself. When people are saying, all is well and secure, there's peace and safety, which is what those Riders on the red horse in Zechariah 1 said, right? Hey, the earth, earth's all, they're, they're all quiet. And, and yeah, there is peace and safety. Then in a moment, unforeseen destruction, ruin and death will come upon them suddenly as labor pains come upon a woman with child. And see, that refers to Revelation 12 about the woman is the church and she's pregnant with the man-child. And it says, and they will by no means escape, for there will be no escape. But you are not in darkness, brethren, for that day to overtake you by surprise like a thief. Deception, remember, is the nature of Satan's warfare against us. And one of the biggest, most effective tools that the devil uses to deceive us is inactivity or lethargy or fatigue or all, all of that meaning I mean like he just he beats us down so that we're passive now I'm not saying okay go out and get a bullhorn and a sign and stand out on the street corner and shout I'm not saying that that I mean you can be that and still kind of be brain dead a lot of the people who are doing that, they, can't, they don't really know what's going on either. They just feel an urge to do something. It's kind of like when you say, do something even if it's wrong. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes if you feel an urge to do something even if it's wrong, a lot of times it is wrong. <laughs> okay, so what you need to do in those cases is, okay, Lord, I'm listening. You know, get your ears, get your antenna up. Okay, that's what we need to do. Well, uh, there are some other things. Go to Romans chapter 15. It really is getting serious, boy. It is. Romans chapter 15. Uh, faith comes by what? Hearing. Okay. My, okay, listen. This is, this, is not, this is not condemnation, what I'm fixing to say. This is not, um, this is not me being uh, critical. This is an observation about current about modern day life. P 
People don't read much anymore. They don't listen. They look. Everything is, is on a screen. Okay? Now, okay, is that a way to trans transfer information? Yes, it is. But they get people so addicted. See, there's something that happens to your brain waves when, you, when you're doing this rather than you're sitting there in, like you're doing now and you're listening. Your brain is functioning at a higher level now than it is when you're doing this. You know, when you're doing this, you're in an alpha state. You're all, it's like a couple of more degrees and you're asleep when you're doing this. Okay? That's why they tell you don't text or don't look at your cell phone when you're driving your car. Because your reaction time is not as, as sharp. When you're listening and you're paying attention to what is being said. Now that is key. It's not just that, you know, it's coming in here and then going out there. That's not listening. Okay? That's not hearing. You know, I know Owen used to say, well, you're not hearing me. It's like, yeah, I know what you just said. I could quote back to you. But he said, but you're not, you're not paying attention to it. You're not processing it. You're not thinking about it. You're not meditating on it. You're saying, well, what does that mean to me? You're not digesting. That's good. See, that's how you get faith. You don't get faith by watching some preacher on a screen say stuff. In fact, you probably won't remember a whole lot of that. You know, you, you, all I want you to do is make you come back or, you know, subscribe to that channel. <laughs> I mean, now look, we have, a, we have a YouTube channel. We do this. But we do this for people who basically are in other countries or off in the boondocks somewhere and they don't have a church that they can go to where somebody's going to preach to them what we're preaching. So that's the best they can do. But what I'm saying is, Hearing the word, and it word, okay, what does word mean? Uh, now, we can say, well, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, what are those thousand words? You know, I, I would say one word of God is worth a thousand pictures. You know, you need to get used to the idea that God speaks, you know, painting, uh, drawing, um, <laughs> photography, um, art, those are human inventions. You'd say, well, yeah, but God paints the, paints the, the sky blue and He paints the, the trees red in the fall. No, He spoke those things into being. And then they did, with the power of God that was inserted into them, they did what they do. Humans paint. Humans make television stations and make cameras and put the person up there to talk so you can see that. That's stuff humans do. That's not how God works. God speaks. And if you're not a word person, you need to be. Can you speak English? Yes. <laughs> then you're a word person. How did you learn to speak English? You heard your parent or somebody else speak. Or, okay, how about this one? I went to France in 1977. I couldn't speak a word of French. I couldn't even count to ten. And I got a little Bur Burlitz phrase book and I learned to say, where is the bathroom? Où est le bagno? Or où est le, le, le bidet? Or whatever it was. <laughs> and and I, could, I learned all to count and I learned how their money works. And, and you know, after three months, I called back to, to Texas and, and I was talking to the French operator and saying, you know, je connect moi to Fort Worth, Texas. And, and my parents were here and I said, boy, you learned French real well. And it's like, no, I don't think I did. How did that happen? Well, I was around it all the time. I was hearing it spoken. So how are you going to learn the Word of God? You have to hear it spoken and then you have to associate it with what's here, what is written. Say, well, I don't like to read. Too bad. Get over it. You're not Smith Wigglesworth who was illiterate and his wife had to teach him the ABC so he could learn to read the Bible and then he became one of the most powerful ministers of the gospel there ever, ever was. You can read. Can you make a pie? <laughs> then you can read. Read this. Okay, verse 4, for Romans 15, verse 4. Whatever was written in former days was written. What does that mean? 
It's in a book. You've got to read it. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't read. Well, you're, 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 you're tossing away something God gave you for your spiritual maturity. You say, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that. You're telling God, hey, I don't want to mature spiritually. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> right? For whatever was written, I'll tell you why you don't like to read, because the devil condemns you. He gets in your mind and tells you, you're stupid. You can't get this. You don't understand what it means. And that's, those are all lies. That's right. He wouldn't tell you that if that was the truth. That's right. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that by steadfast endurance and encouragement drawn from the scriptures. That word scripture is the word graphe, which means to write. Drawn from the scriptures, we might hold fast to and cherish hope. Okay, here's something else. I get it. You know, we talked on Wednesday night, I talked about the Pharisees. And I talked about how there is a tendency, I suppose, within people to kind of uh, have the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Or to, to, okay, I see what this says, so I can pretend to do that, and then everybody will think I'm this. There's a term for that. It's called virtue signaling. You find this uh, among whatever ideology there is. If you're social justice warriors, then you'll throw out some phrases you know, that sound like you're woke or something. Or if you're a conservative, then you, you throw out some phrases that like, you talk about the gay agenda or you know, this or that. And it's like, hey, I'm, I'm, one, of the, I'm one of the cool ones because I can spout those words. It has to be more than spouting words. I get that. But that doesn't mean you should throw the words away. But something else. Well, keep the place here. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It said there that what was written in former times. Now let me say, and I think Steve talked about this Friday night. The news media hasn't always been such a, a bald-faced propaganda uh, system as it currently is. There once was a time they really tried to inform the public about what was going on. And this is the same thing about the Bible. We should, we should read the Bible as, okay, what's in here? Yeah, that happened back thousands of years ago. But it applies today. Like the more things change, the more they remain the same. Stuff happens over and over and over. Or I'll let the Scripture say it. Ecclesiastes verse, chapter 1 verse 9. The thing that it has been is what will be again. And that which has been done is what will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And you say, well, okay, but God does new things. Well, God's not under the sun. God's above the sun. So if we're talking about under the sun, we're talking about human affairs, right? And he said there's nothing new there. Why is there nothing new there? Because the devil, if the whole world is under the power of the devil. He does the same stuff over and over again. Why? Because it works. There's nothing new under the sun. Go back to Romans chapter 15. That's why we need to read the scriptures. That's why you need to understand the stories from the Bible. I thank God that from my earliest memories in, in childhood, my parents took me to church and to Sunday school, and I heard the stories. I heard about Noah. I heard about Lot. I heard about David. I heard about Daniel in the lion's den, and on and on and on. From three years old up, that, that's a part of my makeup. I mean, that's a blessing. I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. My parents did that for me, and we should do that for our kids or our grandkids. Okay, but... Anyway, uh, verse 1. Yeah, who, he, you who are strong in convictions and faith, 
ought to bear with the failings and frailties and tender scruples of the weak. We ought to help carry the doubts and qualms of others and not to please ourselves. You say, well, why do I have to do that? Well, if you're in the foxhole with them, their, their failures and their inabilities and their problems are going to end up being your problems because we're mutually dependent. And see, this is something maybe it's a little hard for us Americans and particularly us Western Americans, you know, us Texans. To get, I mean, we're so used to the idea of rugged individualism that we don't really look at life like no man is an island. That, that we are all, that what happens to one affects what happens to all. It's like this is, this is not, you know, okay, it is your personal relationship with God. Each person has to get born again themselves. You don't get born again just by being a member of a church. Got that. Okay, and what you get revelation-wise from God is yours. I mean, he might give you something. He might tell you something he doesn't tell everybody else. I had a dream this morning, David, but, I, I, you know, you got him to tell you, told your dream. I, I thought, well, maybe I better get him to tell my dream. And God says, that was for you, Ray. So it's like, okay, I won't tell the dream. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the dream. Okay, but my point being, even though... There is our individual relationship with God. We must not have the illusion that what we do doesn't affect other people because it does. And that's what he's saying here. And he's, he's making a particular point about those who are not where we're at, who don't understand things we understand. Okay, don't take this as condemnation or, or criticism. This is just an observation. But a big problem for the whole body of Christ, including Romans 8, is, is that we have been, I think the word is parochial, which is a big two-bit word that means we're kind of ensconced in our own little world. You know, we have our Romans 8 speak. We have our, our way of, of looking at Christianity. And we think we're right. But you know, so did all of them others out there. And we can't all be right. I mean, we could all be wrong, but, I, but, but my point is, if you, if you have some knowledge or some revelation or understanding that somebody else has, it is not right to look down upon that person and think that you are superior to them or to think that, well, they don't belong, so they need to, they need to leave. You know, we're all Christians under construction. We, we all have our baggage. We all have our genetic makeup. We all have our training. We all have our upbringing. We all have our experiences in life. And they're not all the same. And yes, ultimately God wants us all to look like Jesus. And you know, He's bringing us all to that place all together. But that word together means it's not just me and the heck with the rest of you. Okay. Verse 2. Let us make it a practice to make happy our neighbor for his good and his true welfare. Now, that could be misunderstood. Some people think, well, I'm supposed to accommodate everybody's desires and wishes. Well, no. If their desires and wishes aren't for their welfare, you should not accommodate that. You know, so sometimes this comes up in the deal about women's submission. It's like, well, I'm supposed to submit to my husband, so if he says we've got to go to a bar, then I've got to go to the bar with him and get drunk. No, you don't. That's not, for, that's not good for him. And you have to say, no, that's not good. Jack, don't go there. I'm not going with you. But if he says, hey, I, I, I don't want to go to Albertsons today. I want to go to Kroger's. <laughs> you, you, you shouldn't say, oh, I like Kroger's better than Albertsons. So you go to Albertsons if you want to. I'm going to Kroger's. See, that, his welfare, he's not better off going to, to Kroger's than he is going to Albertson's. The, the, stuff, the cereal's the same price both places. <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? If it's, not a, if it's not a moral issue, we should try to accommodate other people's 
views on things. Uh, to please not to, to please your neighbor and build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches and abuses of those who reproached and abused you fell on me. Go to Joel chapter 2. Talking about serious times. And us getting serious in those serious times. Joel 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. I remember hearing a song by that title. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. See, I'm telling you, these, these things have happened before. Israel came under judgment a bunch of times. There was the one we read about with Jesus, but back hundreds of years before that, they got carried away into captivity. And before that, you know, after, after God brought them out of uh, Egypt and gave them into the land of Canaan, they fell into idolatry, and then the Midianites and the Philistines and all of the other ites and eens came in and, and messed with them. Right? Let all of the land tremble. For the day of judgment is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick mist and darkness. Like the morning dawn spread upon the mountains comes a people numerous and mighty which has never been seen before and shall not again be seen even to many years of many generations. Well, that's, that's a pretty good description of what we're looking at now. What is he talking about? Well, I can't say God has showed me the full extent of it, but let's make no mistake, what the devil has, the stuff that the devil has been doing to humanity for a long time now is, is the stuff of science fiction. I mean, there's stuff that sounds crazy that he's doing, that he is able to do, that man has cooperated with him and given him the, the opening to bring those technologies, to bring those spirit forces, to bring that into our world. And God has let him do it. Well, why has God let him do it? Because humanity was wanting what he was offering. Just like when Adam and Eve wanted what the serpent offered them in the garden. If you want what, devil, what the devil's offering you, you get it. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. I guess that's what I'm doing this morning. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Set apart a fast. Ho, oh, oh. ah, ho. Now this is interesting. Ray, are you saying that to get serious I need to fast? Yes, I'm saying that. Keep the place here. Let's talk about that right there. Go back to Luke. Chapter 4. So then, what does fasting accomplish? Well, simply put, it makes you more aware of the spirit realm and how that realm interacts with your physical reality. You know, yeah, you may become aware of, of discomforts in your body. You may not feel good. Or maybe you will. I mean, I, that's, that's not my point. How you feel is not the point. It does say you afflict yourself with fasting. So that the implication is there, fasting is not something pleasant. It's not something you're going to choose. And, okay, let, let's just deal with something else here. The, the, it is sometimes said, and I think it's valid, that a fast doesn't always have to be food. 
For example, someone might say, well, hey, you know, I, I'm on such and such a medication, and, and if I go cold turkey on that, then, you know, there might be some, some bad repercussions to that. Well, you pray about this. There might be something else that you can willingly, deliberately deprive yourself of that's not going to put your health in danger. Okay? Like coffee. Or sugar. Or, or television. Well, wh why would you say that? Well, okay. Now, I'm not one of these people, but there are those people who feel like the television has to be going all the time so they feel kind of safe and secure within their space. And okay, maybe it's because they grew up and there was a lot of noise in the household and that's kind of normal for them. Or, or maybe they, they just kind of like noise. I don't like noise. I, I like silence, but some people don't. Okay, so if you like noise, then maybe you should put yourself in a position where you have silence for seven days. That's going to be just as earth-shaking as you doing without food for seven days. Or maybe in my case, maybe I need to, uh, you know, go, go, go walk through a mall every day where there's noise going on all the time. I'm, I'm not going to choose that. I mean, I think I'll go the food route myself. But I'm just saying this is what the, the value of a fast is. And why, what's the value? It's because then you become aware of spiritual realities that currently you were kind of numbed to. Luke chapter 4. When Jesus was baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he went 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted, tried, and tested by the devil. Oh, he was encountering the spirit realm. And he ate nothing during those days. And when those days were completed, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, Well, if you are the Son of God, order this stone to be turned into a loaf of bread. And Jesus replied to him, It is written. Again, it's words. It is written, Man shall not live and be sustained only by bread, but by every word and expression of God. And my point here is, if you're fasting, whatever energy or time or effort you would be putting into what that normal activity is, fill that void with the word. Okay? Go back to Joel. Keep the place in Luke, though. <clears throat> Blow the trumpet in Zion. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Set apart a fast. Call a solemn assembly. You know, next week, as I said, is, is what, they call holy, what the church calls Holy Week. I think that would be a wonderful time to do a fast of some sort. You know, typically, in Romans 8, we've fasted as a church at the time of Day of Atonement. When you do it is not the point, really. I mean, okay, feast days are a good time to do it. There was nothing that said fast during Passover. The only thing that they said during Passover was you can't eat bread with leaven in it. You can only eat, in other words, you can't eat fluffy, nice Mrs. Baird's bread. You have to eat crackers. Okay, but, or, or hardtack biscuit. But anyway, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride from her closet. No one is exempt. When all hell breaks loose on this planet, nobody's going to be exempt. It's not going to be, well, all the men have to go report to the, to the induction center, but women and children, y'all just go about your business. It's not going to be like that, folks. It wasn't like that for the, the citizens of Europe in World War II. I mean, women and children got bombed and killed just as much. In fact, most of the, there, there were more casualties in World War II that were civilian than there were that were military. And I think it's going to be exponentially more in the time to come. Okay. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. See, this is not a message you're hearing on Christian media. 
They're saying rejoice. They're saying celebrate. They're not saying weep. They're, they're not saying grieve. They're saying, oh, that displeases God. You know, you should know. You should just be full of joy now. Well, it does say that, but this, we're, we're talking about a, a particular response to a particular situation. Weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Lord, have pity on your people and spare them and give not your heritage to reproach so that the heathen nation should rule over them and use a byword against them saying, Where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and had pity on his people. Yes, the Lord answered and said, Behold, I am sending you grain and juice and oil, and you shall be satisfied with them, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations." Flee to the wilderness. Right? Well, another thing about fasting. Go to Isaiah chapter 58. You know, over there in uh, <clears throat> Romans 15, where we talked about being conscious of the needs of others. Scripture tell us that that's another value or that's something else you gain through fasting. Because what you're doing, basically, is you're, you're deliberately, intentionally depriving yourself of something which normally you feel you have a right to have. What you're doing when you do that then is you are experiencing firsthand what those who are deprived of that thing have all the time. They're like, you're not eating, then you're, you're seeing what three billion people in this earth go through every day. That, that changes your perspective. Isaiah 58, verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, that you should break every enslaving yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your house, and when you see the naked that you cover them? Now I'm not, it's not, let's don't just interpret this in the, in the natural and the physical, saying, well, okay, I need to start a homeless ministry out of my home. No, your house is your heart. Okay, you need to bring those people who are destitute into your heart, into your thinking, into your prayers. And so that you cover him and that you hide not from the needs of your own flesh and blood. Then your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness and your justice and your relationship with God shall go for, forth before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Okay, up there in verse 6, he said, this is the fast that I have chosen. Well, that means this is, this is how God looks at the value of fasting. It's not just so that we can gain some spiritual brownie points for ourselves, but so he can make us more like what he wants us to be. Well, let me tell you a fast God has not chosen. This is what fasting is not supposed to be. Keep the place here in Isaiah. Go back to Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> Verse 9. Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous and scorned and made nothing at all of the rest of men. Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee was considered a, a holy man in their culture and the tax collector was considered low life. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously, meaning in a showy way, 
And he began to pray thus before and with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men. Extortioners, robbers, swindlers, Democrats. No, he didn't say that. Okay. Adulterers or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. <gasps> wait, 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 back up, back up, back up, back up. He fasts twice a week. There ain't no fast. What, he, he, he skipped breakfast on Monday and then he skipped lunch on Thursday. Yeah, he fasted twice a week. A fast is going to, I mean, if, if it were a fast, he'd say, well, I only ate two days last week. I mean, in, in, in my book, doing something twice a week like that, there's no cost in that. He's not afflicting himself. Now, I, look, now I'm not saying that, that doing without meals has no no benefit. Sometimes it's good for, Pat will tell you, <coughs> sometimes it's good from a health point of view to, to, to not eat several times during the week to help your body kind of cleanse the, the toxins and stuff. Okay, but that's not a fast. That's not a fast God has chosen. That's a, that's a health fast. Okay, and, and you, you have certain kind of medical procedures they'll tell you, well, don't eat anything the night before. Okay, that's not a fast. They'll call it a fast, but that's not a fast God has chosen. And there's something else even more to the point here. The, the Pharisee is fasting so he can show how righteous he is. See, that's that what I call virtue signaling. When you do something holy or something right just to show how right you are. Now, okay. There is a limited value in virtue signaling. There is a limited value in <clears throat> putting your amen, putting your check mark on something that, that is deemed to be holy. You know, you, you hear the word preacher say, Amen, brother. That doesn't necessarily mean you're holy, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do that because that at least means you are, you are giving your assent to what the right way is. Now, you need to live by, you need to live by your amen and not just do it so people will think, you know, a shyster could do that. A shyster would come in and say, oh, yes, amen, brother. And so you'll think they're a Christian when they really aren't. Okay, but we're not talking about that. But that's what the Pharisee was doing, really. He was doing this fast so he could prove to all of his peers, hey, I'm, I'm a holy man here. Look at me. I tithe and I fast twice a week. That's not the fast God's chosen. Because... <clears throat> Verse 9 says, Then you shall call on the Lord. <clears throat> you shall cry and He will say, Here I am. If you take away from your midst yokes of oppression, wherever you find them, a finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly, and every form of false, harsh, unjust, or wicked speaking, and if you pour out that with which you sustain your own life for the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your obscurity and gloom become like the noonday. These are the things that we want. This is not just, Anne, I think your ride is here. I heard the, heard the doorbell. Yeah. And the Lord shall guide you continually and satisfy you in drought. Now, this is, this is interesting because... <clears throat> not just a drought like what California had in previous years. I think drought in Scripture is often a metaphor for God's blessing is not upon a place. You know, in, even in the Millennial Kingdom, it says when there's a, <clears throat> a city or an area that doesn't go up to Jerusalem every year for, to observe the feast, then on them it's not going to rain. Well, see, the rain is a metaphor for God's blessing. 
upon you. So he's saying that if you, if you do this, if, if, you, if your heart is in your devotion to the Lord, then even if all around you there's judgment, there's trouble, there's death, like Psalm 91, then only a spectator will you be. He said, he will satisfy you in drought and in dry places and make strong your bones. <clears throat> and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. And you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called a repairer of the breach, a restorer of the streets to live in. You know, I think this ultimately is going to be the job of the, the man-child in the, in the wilderness for three and a half years. <clears throat> but see, we want to get there. And we're not there yet. And so, what we're, what we're talking about there, this is the path forward. This is how we get there. And verse 13 says, And if you turn away your foot from traveling unduly on the Sabbath. And I'm not talking about Seventh-day Adventism here. Okay. From traveling unduly on the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and you will call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable and honor Him. That's the key right there. Not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or speaking your own idle words. Then will you delight yourself in the Lord. Now, you know that's interesting. In verse 14 there, he doesn't say, then the Lord will delight Himself in you. It says, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. What is this telling us? It's telling us uh, the ball's in our court. This, telling, this is telling us what you do for the Lord if you do it honestly, genuinely, as a desire to please Him and to, to be what He wants you to be, you will be better off for it. Your life will improve. You will delight yourself in the Lord. I will make you to ride on the high places of the earth. You know, that I've wondered many times, Steve, how is it that the woman in the wilderness and the, the man-child are going to be protected or, or not troubled by all of this stuff, you know, the, the stars falling from the sky and turning the rivers to blood and the, 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 the goons coming out of the holes in the earth and stinging people and all of that stuff. How are they going to be protected? Well, you know, it, it says already we're seated with God in heavenly places. Well, wait a minute, what does that mean? Well, we're here in Fort Worth now, but it says we're seated in heavenly places. It's like you can be in Fort Worth, Texas, but if you're seated in heavenly places, you're not harmed by what's happening in Fort Worth, Texas. Right? That's riding on the high places of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage promised to Jacob your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Okay, this is getting serious, folks. It's getting serious out there, and we need to get serious. So, Father, I thank you that you will help us all do that. That your Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance what you have said, not just this morning, but at all times when you have spoken to us that, that you, have, you have a plan, you have a purpose, that you have called us. You chose us. We didn't choose you. But you said that we would bear fruit and that our fruit would be lasting and that it would remain. And so, Father, I thank you for that work that is ongoing in each one of our lives. And you said that you would continue that work right up until the day of your return. And we thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.